Welcome to AXA Car Live. We're broadcasting to you from the Kanabi Research Station on Curaçao. Now, Curaçao is in the Caribbean. It's in the Southern Caribbean, part of the Netherlands Antilles, with Aruba and Bonaire as well. And that's just to the north of Venezuela. And as I mentioned, we're at the Kamabi Field Research Station, and that provides an amazing support to visiting scientists from around the world, and also has permanent research facilities and research scientists here as well. Now those visiting scientists can be supported through accommodation, but also through the science facilities here. So you've got dry labs with scientific equipment such as microscopes, and also providing opportunities to analyze any samples you've picked up from the reef. There are wet labs where you can conduct experiments using both the samples you collect and using the seawater pumped in from the nearby reef. And one of the great things about having this field research station and field is the science term we give to the great outdoors, so close to the reef, the reef is 50 meters offshore here, is that scientists can be in their lab, think, right, well, the next stage in my work is to go and collect some samples from the ocean or to go and find out what kind of processes are happening here or set up an experiment, get their scuba gear, potentially uh, use rebreathers to go deeper on the reef and then they're out in the environment that they're studying. And so it's wonderful to be here amongst this community of scientists and to have them not only give us advice and share insight into their work but also join us on these Meet the Experts live lessons. And I'm very glad to be welcoming Nick, uh, one of the researchers here at Kamabi. Uh, to this session. Nick, we're just going to see which schools are joining us um, today. We have schools from the US, uh, from Canada, uh, from Lithuania and from the UK. So hello uh, to all those students watching and we have some very special shout outs as well. We have a shout out to uh, the US. We have Swan River School and Union Point Academy. Hi to all the students who are there. Really lovely to see you. Um, thank you so much for joining from Silver Star Elementary in Vernon, British Columbia, Canada. Hi to all the students there. Um, to Vilnius uh, Seminars Gymnasium um, watching from Lithuania. Hi to everybody uh, watching from Lithuania. And also we have watching from Toronto in Canada, Blessed Sacrament School. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, and we're just, just in, uh, and one more shout out to the grade six, seven class who are watching from London, Ontario, again in Canada. A wonderful uh, group of schools dialing in, beaming in from Canada as well. And it's just great to have you all involved. I'm just checking down just to make sure I've got all the shout outs through. Nick, I mean, we've got this this really great uh, live lesson ahead of us. We've got a chance to talk to you a little bit about your research. I know you've got some goodies in store for us a bit later. Uh, and then we've got an opportunity to get through uh, some of the questions uh, that have been submitted in advance and also any that come up on the live chat during this call. So, uh, Nick, you're here at Kamabi. What, what's brought you to Kamabi? Why are you here? <laughs> Why am I here? Uh, good question. Um, I kind of just ended up here. Um, I know a lot of people want to become a marine biologist when they grow old. Um, that, that was never the case for me. I was just kind of following the things I'm good at, the things I'm passionate about. Um, and yeah, that got me here. And, and when you're here, what, what kind of things are you studying? You're obviously part of a research team here, but you've probably got your own separate research I projects. I have my own little projects, that's yeah. true, yeah, and obviously I try to take advantage. You just mentioned we have a really nice facility here. We have our, our lab, then our office, the dive shop, and the reef, everything basically in the condo line. Uh, it's a dream for marine scientists. 
And uh, yeah, we have the coral reefs right here in front of our doors. So perfect place to study them, perfect place to, you know, dive into the mysteries of coral reefs, how they work, how they function. You know, the, the main question of my research is yeah. actually goes, goes back all the way to Charles Darwin, who was already sailing on these reefs. And he put two things together. He put together that reefs are incredibly diverse and productive because mm -hmm. he saw there's so many different animals and they're just producing, producing biomass by building up entire structures that coral reefs are. But the other thing was the water is crystal clear here. You can see sometimes Beautiful. 30, 40 <laughs> meters wide. Beautiful, right? So Darwin figured there can't be much in it. If the water is so clear, there must be very little food. So what coral reefs are, they, they're essentially um, an oasis in a marine desert. Okay. And he was confused by that. Um, so over the centuries, basically, we started discovering that uh, reefs are solar cities, biological okay. solar cities, especially in the 1950s when people invented dive gear. And we yep. were able to really dive down and take samples, start measuring. We noticed they're acquiring sunlight, just like terrestrial forests. Um, plants and algae, the equivalent yeah. in the marine, um, do photosynthesis and assimilate energy this way, but how does this energy retain in the system? And okay. that is basically what I'm trying to answer. I, absolutely amazing. I, I, and I mean, as a, as a marine Hello. scientist, um, you must be uh, working underwater a lot. Yes, <laughs> that's true. Uh, what, what, what's it like uh, to work underwater? Incredible. It's yeah. basically like working in space, you know, you're, you're not walking in your ecosystem, you're flying through it. You can uh, go not only right and left and back and front, you can go up and down, yeah. which is nice, yes. but also challenging. Okay. <laughs> so you can't place some tools just somewhere and then focus on something else. It will just float or sink away. Uh, so you need to always be conscious of where things are, tie things up. Uh, your body moves with the currents, right? So you need to figure out how to keep your buoyancy. Um, having fine motorics while there's a lot of search can be difficult. Okay. Communication is one thing. Yes, you know, if, no, no chatting. If I try to say, hey, could you grab me that little tool? What you're going to understand? Yeah. <laughs> right? So <laughs> communication is challenging and you need to kind of figure out ways to do that with sign language mm -hmm. but like if you work with the same people over and over again at some point this becomes really easy and you just look at each other's eyes you know what the other one's saying so that's really interesting brilliant and and you've got one of the pieces of uh science equipment that you use underwater here that's right um what what is this <laughs> What is this? So this is a, what we call an incubation chamber. And okay. An incubation is basically just a confinement of something. Um, we put this out on the reef, uh -huh. and then we put an organism, an animal or a plant inside of it, and then we close this up. There's all rings here so we can make this really tight, and then we just wait and see what this organism does to the water. Okay. We measure oxygen concentration, that's this log right here. Yep. Gives us a nice reading every minute. We need to steer the water to make sure it's always circulated, otherwise it will just sit. Yep. And that's what this thing does. Okay. Basically, it's just a big battery. There's a magnetic little piece on the bottom that turns. Ah, and see. Yeah. that leads to a nice little circulation that's good for the organism in it, but it's also good for our measurements. Because we want, of course, everything to be mixed up well when mm -hmm. we measure the amounts of um, food in the water, the amounts of bacteria in the water. Um, and if we do this over time, uh, we can figure out what this organism in this chamber is doing to the water. And, and, and you talk about putting animals in here, you put in sort of octopus and fish and that <laughs> kind of thing in here? Or no, that would, be, <laughs> that would be um, quite a prison for them. I yeah. mean, things that move like to move. Yeah. Uh, we're working with these chambers on sessile organisms. So we're incubating and corals. Sessile means ones that stick. It's fixed on a certain okay. spot, it cannot move. Uh, so that's corals, algae, uh, sponges. Okay. All the main components, we call that benthic. So all the organisms that live on the ground uh -huh. and do not move and they build the coral reef structure, those are benthic organisms. So, so benthic is, is and the benthos, is, that's just, just from the Greek for basically the bottom. Exactly, yeah. that's where it comes from, yeah. Okay, amazing. And <laughs> why are we imprisoning sponges? <laughs> what, and, what, and especially, you know, what is a sponge? Because are you just essentially putting a, a, a bathroom accessory in, into a very, you know, simple bit of, of science equipment? 
So uh, what I put there in is real sponge organisms, which are actually animals. Okay. So they might not look like it, but uh, we can see from the type of cells they have and from the things they do, they filter water um, and they actively really interact with the, with the outer environment in the way that animals do. Uh, so we know they're animals and we're not, I mean, yes, we are imprisoning them in here. And they might have a bit of a rough time if we do this too long. Yep. But um, to be honest, they, they fight for space out there, huh? and they're, okay. they're competing with each other. So if you put them in a confinement, it might also be like a little break from that, and they Fair get enough. a little bit of Fair relaxation enough. time. Uh, and before, you know, the things these organisms feed on are depleted, yep. we open the chamber and we put them out on the reef. And so, so what's it like working underwater with this bit of kit? So, so how would you go about um, using it out on the reef? So basically, um, we just simply open this up, put the organism in. We try uh -huh. to get nice outer reef water. That's why okay. we put this in the field also. We yep. want to get as close as possible to the, to the condition on the reef when we mm -hmm. take our measurements. Mm -hmm. So we just let this chamber fill with the reef water. Yep. We put the organism inside, we close it. And then we basically just sample. We have these two sampling ports. And okay. then we can wait a bit and we can sample basically seawater into a simple syringe. Ah, and okay. this syringe, we take back out here, five minutes later, I'm in my lab, I'm processing the water, I'm counting how many bacteria are in there, and I'm doing different measurements to characterize the water. And, and so, you've mentioned bacteria a little bit, mm -hmm. um, why, why, why are we looking at bacteria at the moment? I mean, surely mm -hmm. we should be looking at, you know, just, just healthy big animals and that kind of thing. <laughs> why are we looking at the little stuff? Because these healthy big animals, we've looked at them for quite a while already. Okay. We've looked at corals. We understand corals pretty well. Uh -huh. Still a lot to discover about them, but we have a pretty good understanding how they reproduce, how they feed, how they interact with and compete with other mm -hmm. organisms. Same is true for macroalgae, for fish, all the conspicuous stuff that you see. When you go yeah. dive on the reef, it comes in your face. That's what we study. And only recently, you know, with new tools coming available, molecular uh, methods where we can really look at the small stuff that you can't see, uh, helped us find out that these things really matter. Okay. So, and with the tools available, now there's a really big hype in science and coral reef research to look at these small things. And we're redefining how these systems work, um, basically using these modern tools. I mean, I mean, someone's saying that a sponge, could half the biomass, half the weight of the sponge could be bacteria. Yeah, in some species that's the case actually, yeah. I, I, I mean, absolutely amazing. Um, I've heard rumours, tell me if this is true or not, You've been putting tents up on the reef. <laughs> yes, I guess we have a photo of it. Um, with the tents, it's always a bit tricky because... Why, yeah, why, why, why tents? I mean, uh, in this chamber, we can only put individual organisms, right? Uh, okay. We cannot really uh, incubate a whole community. But that's actually important because organisms interact. And if you put a single organism in here, you don't capture this interaction. So to incubate entire patches of communities, we need to use these, these tents or similar methods. Mm -hmm. And obviously you need to be careful to, le to select your spot, to not smother any sensitive organisms. So that tent you see there is actually on a quite degraded site where we're putting it on algae, which yep. grows back very quickly. And it's actually, uh, there's too much of it anyways on these reefs. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can incubate entire communities. And we do the same that I just described for this system. Uh, we sample the water, we measure the oxygen, we look at the activity of the organisms in there, and then we try to compare if the results we get from individual organisms and the results we get from, from the patches kind of make sense. And so that's looking at bacterial levels? For example, the amount of bacteria that are taken up, released, the amount of nutrients, um, other dissolved compounds like sugars, um, all of these concentrations change depending on what organism you have. So, so you've got this, you, I mean, from what it sounds like, a, a focus on, on this dissolved sugar as, as, as a food that, that, that mm -hmm. has an energy pathway through the reef and it goes from the sponge and then out into other organisms, other living things. Mm -hmm. um, that must be easier to, to really identify what's happening to the food, to the energy, sugars on the reef if you do it in a lab or if you do it in a confined space 
aren't you worried that if you use this tenty thing on the reef that you might not know exactly what's going on? It might not be a really sort of a fair test? You do actually. You do not exactly know what's going on. And that's why we separate these very controlled experiments okay. from things like those benthic tents. Um, you do want to have, uh, in a, if, you, if you want to measure whether a certain factor has an effect, you should change only that factor and keep yep. everything else consistent. Yeah, that's what we learn in science. In different yes. the scientific method, right? Yep. Uh, so that's, that's how we find out if something has an effect or can have an effect. Mm -hmm. But we do need to verify if this effect actually happens in nature. Got it. So that's why we do these, uh, use these tents. We keep track of all of the different factors that change, and then mm -hmm. we go back to our results and we see, okay, can we kind of see this pattern that we get from experiments like this? Got it. In those tents, yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank, thank you so much. Absolutely fascinating introduction to what goes into uh, doing science on the reef, and uh, and also uh, some of those elements that we, we we talk about in the science classroom, sort of working scientifically how. Uh, those aren't just, you know, made up by your teacher. Those are actually, uh, you know, concepts that you have to apply when you're doing any research, but, you know, the research in the field here. Mm -hmm. um, so really great to hear that. Um, we've got questions coming through. We've got questions first from Edmonton in Canada. Uh, and this is Millie. Um, Millie would love to know, uh, what is your favorite animal on the reef and why? Hi, Millie. Hey, my favorite animal. Mm, interesting question. Um... I would say the favorite animal I have is nudibranchs. Okay. Nudibranchs are a type of snail, but without a shell. Slug, a sea slug. It's a sea slug, basically. Okay. Um, and the reason I like them so much is because they can be incredibly beautiful. They have all kinds of patterns and colorful shapes. Just type in nudibranch into Google and you'll understand why they are my favorite I think, I think we actually have a nudibranch gallery on the Encounter EDU website. There you go. Uh, so Check we'll, out we'll, those we'll nudibranchs. We'll see if we can get, <laughs> get that up. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Um, Isaac um, in Edmonton would like to know, um, can coral grow in cold water? That's a great question, Isaac. That's a good question too, and the answer to that is yes. Uh, certainly, the species that live in hot waters are uh, not adapted to live in colder waters, but there's other species that live in colder waters. We have reefs in the Mediterranean. They f maybe don't look like the reefs we have here. A uh, lot less diversity in terms of corals, but uh, they're definitely there, and also in the deep sea. Water in the deep sea is cold. We have entire coral reefs in the deep sea. And guess how much they are researched? Uh, not very much, but an amazing much. research team um, out of Harriet Watts University in, in, in the UK um, doing some great research on the Mingale Lophelia Reef um, in the Scottish Islands. How deep? Um, that is a very good question. I'll have to go <laughs> back to that. But if you talk about the black corals and the use of ROVs down to sort of thousands of meters, yes, yeah, yeah. you do need a, um, a, a, a big ship, yeah, yeah. a big ROV to go and do that. Um, but wow. uh, it's much more difficult, I think, is what we're saying, yes. to, just to study these deeper, these deeper reefs. It's usually quite expensive to and get things down there. <laughs> yes. uh, coming up, we have Jane. Would like to know how long have you already spent at university and how long might you spend at university? University can be a whole career. Mm -hmm. uh, that's true. Uh, the time I have spent at the university so far is 10 years. That includes my bachelor's, my master's and now the first two years of my PhD. Okay. Um, I will probably spend another few years in academics, maybe do a postdoc, which is the logical step after your PhD. Mm -hmm. um, just get my foot into the, into the picture and uh, get my name out there and then see what happens. Um, Harry's interested, when did you first become interested in the ocean? Because mm -hmm. it, it's a very sort of, for many people it's quite a distant mm -hmm. environment. Mm -hmm. when, when did you first become interested? Uh, first interested I was in 2004, so that's by now about 16 years ago. Um, I was still a little kid, I did my dive license in Egypt. Uh, and unfortunately, the sites that we saw there were some of the sites that degraded quite a lot okay. in the, in the dec following decade. Uh, so we went back there three years later, and then again three years later, and there's uh, quite a big change I saw in those systems. I, it might have actually, you know, contributed to me being here today. I never really consciously made this decision, yeah. as I mentioned, but 
But that was certainly something that broke my heart. And that's when I got interested because it's when I noticed that we can't just do what we want. It, it, there's changes to the ecosystems. So finding out that it's us leading to these changes um, really brought up some, some motivation to, to figure out what is it that, yeah. that's happening and what is it that we can do about it. Um, so is it wonder and then you know a little bit of sadness bringing, bringing you to... More to curiosity. Curiosity. Uh, and beginning at the beginning sadness, true, but yep. then over the years I've seen enough places where you know reefs have recovered, yep. uh, things have come back to life. Yep. Uh, I've been surprised quite a lot of times as to how resilient these ecosystems are and uh, certainly it's, it's not that hard. Once you understand uh, what's actually going on a little bit. We yep. of course don't really understand at all what's going on really, but the, if you get a slight idea, it's not that difficult to stay positive. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, we have um, Rowan would like to know what's the scariest thing that has happened to you in the ocean? The scariest thing that has happened yep. to you? Uh, so actually that... Oof. I, w I would really have to think whether I was scared ever underwater. Um, maybe back then when I was still younger and some of that memory is gone, but the scariest thing I can come up with now is actually this week. Yes. I went on a dive and we had to you know, keep our hands clean, so I was wearing lab gloves instead of yes. my thicker dive gloves. And I actually like, I had to hold on to a little rail and there was a little spiky piece of rock. And I, I, I don't know if you can see it, but like, I hurt my finger. That's probably the, the scariest thing that, that has happened to me. No as snakes, no, no saltwater crocodiles, Well, no I've, I've certainly seen these things, but saltwater crocodile, no. I mean, there you really have to be quite careful. But uh, I've seen many so-called dangerous organisms, yeah. which um, once you see them and how elegant they are, and you understand what their ecology is, you're not scared anymore. So, so I mean, you say so-called scary, why isn't a shark scary? Because sharks, sharks are definitely moody. You can see that you yes, know, yes. there are days where sharks are really relaxed and there are days where they're really a bit aroused and they start circling you, but um, they're so gentle. They can come so close to you and still uh, they don't seem to be frightening because they're not, you can, you can almost tell they're not trying to attack you. Obviously, as an ecologist, you kind of understand what a shark looks like when he's trying to go for something. And they don't look like that. They look mm -hmm. more like, ah, oh, who are you? What is this? Okay. So, okay. yeah. Well, that's it. Um, I guess we're scared of the things we don't understand. We're scared of... So we're once you start understanding... Yeah, we're scared of the unknown. So if they're not too, too unknown anymore, you, you stop being scared. I blame Steven Spielberg. Yeah. <laughs> For creating this he certainly George, played his anyway. part, yeah. Um, <laughs> Olivia, getting down, how do sponges reproduce? Ooh. <laughs> well, who asked that question? As Olivia. Olivia, so maybe you can become a marine biologist and answer that question for us, because uh, there's very, very little we understand about that yet. Um, sponge reproduction seems to be very complex and we're really only at the beginning to understand how they're... For some sponges, we don't even know if it's a male or a female. Or so, both. Yeah, or both. Yep. Sometimes, yeah. So if you don't even know the sex of an organism, how, you, how can you figure out how it reproduces, right? So uh, that's, uh, that's definitely a very interesting niche in science that's yet to be conquered. Wow. Olivia, there's, there's a lifetime's <laughs> work for you out in front already. And it is a lifetime's work, that's for sure. Um, Jessica would like to know, um, how do corals die? How do corals die? Um, I mean, they, they have, I mean, they've, they've died, you know, there's a variety of causes, I imagine, sort of o o over the years. Well, that's two natural. separate questions. So one, yeah. like, what makes corals die? Obviously, they are very adapted to um, certain environments, and they have their thermal yeah. ranges, tolerance, thresholds so for temperature, the, yeah, for acidity, the, things you already covered in okay. your previous sessions this week. And if you go too far out of that threshold for an extended period of time, then yes, your coral is going to die. The other question, how corals die, um, they don't die like just, okay, now I'm dead and that's it. Um, corals fragment when they die. Um, a coral is basically a colony of many individual tiny polyps all next to each other. 
So when there's a stressor coming in, whether that's too hot temperatures, a disease, a reckless diver kicking you with his fin, um, then certain polyps die and the coral will have, you can see that tissue disappearing. And then what's left is the white skeleton underneath. Okay. But some polyps will still remain and then if the stressors are too much, the coral becomes smaller and smaller and at some point the colony has only a single polyp left and if that dies, yeah, you get so, this. So it's a sheet of, 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 no, the thin sheet of coral polyp over the outside of the skeleton. Exactly. And it can retreat, retreat, retreat from covering this is, the whole this thing. This is actually a good example. So yep. I assume this coral was growing like this. And then what you have on the top of it, I mean, this could also be just some mechanical damage. Yep. But uh, what also happens a lot of the times, the sunlight from straight above is a lot ah. stronger than the light from the sides. Can so you just hold, hold this up so we can see it? Yeah, on, so on maybe this here. coral, this part, this part of the coral, the polyps on here uh, didn't survive this very high irradiance, this very high energy light, but that's only this little part and the, rem the remaining part of the coral is still very much intact. And, and you know, if something happens, you get a piece of shading and all of a sudden there's not too much light anymore, I can almost guarantee this coral is going to grow back over it. So corals don't die, corals fragment. Okay. And that can also be a good thing because if you break off a piece of a coral and you put it somewhere else and it has some sort of consolidation, it will keep growing. Okay, yeah. uh, well that's good news there. Um, we're now gonna go to Kieran um, in the UK. Hi Kieran, um, he's um, Kieran's homeschooled. He's got a couple of questions for us. Sure. Um, first one up is how do you feel about plastic in the ocean? Terrible. It's a terrible thing. Um, it's luckily much in the media these days. Uh, we do see the effects here as well. Um, it's just heartbreaking, you know, to go down uh, to these reefs and see, you know, products, um, packaging of some products that are being used once, but then they end up on this reef and they stay there for, for literally a hundred years before it breaks down. So, uh, big problem. Don't okay. feel good about it at all. Brilliant. Um, and second follow a uh, question looking at threats to the reef uh, um, again from Kieran um, great question this is w with climate change what animals will do best and which ones will do worst generally if you compare the reef organisms I would say sponges are certainly doing fairly well up to this point yeah uh, corals not so much as we know um, but there are certain coral species which are also benefiting from it. So you can't really say this class of animals does a good job and this class is really sensitive. There's a species in each class of organisms that, that is a bit more uh, tolerant to the changes that are occurring and there's species that are a bit less tolerant. So you, what we see is a changing ecosystem of different contributions of different species. But in the end we're always going to have corals and algae and sponges. I mean, and it's really important to remember, I think, when we're talking about this, is that, as you pointed out, there's diversity um, between species. It's not just coral. Um, but also, these are animals. So there is a variation in, in how, mm -hmm. I mean, just individual colonies could, could cope with stress. Yeah, uh, sure. And so the, there will be sort of winners and losers, but it's a very sort of diverse and, and more complex than this sort of... Yeah more simplified story or sometimes we get True, in the yeah. media. Even within species, yeah, yeah. You can have an individual that does well and you have another individual that doesn't do well. It's, it's a lot more complex than we thought. The whole, the whole ecosystem is a very complex ecosystem, even in the sense of spatial uh, structure. We have a lot of processes on the reefs that are producing this coral rock, which is mm -hmm. growing this whole ecosystem, but there's also processes that are destroying the ecosystem. Uh, there are organisms that bore into the reef structure. There's also chemical dissolution of yeah, this yeah. piece of rock. Uh, so what you get is a whole bunch of crevices, caves, <laughs> overhangs, a very, very complex system with a lot of different communities. Amazing. Kieran, thank you for, for, the, for those great questions. Um, I've seen that we've got quite a few uh, questions, so we'll, we'll, we'll just sort of do um, so maybe some sort of short, short answers um, mm -hmm. coming through on the live chat. We've got the Blessed Sacrament Catholic School. Um, how does coral bleaching affect our world? Ooh, uh, in many ways, coral bleaching leads to less coral uh, if it persists. And if you have less coral, then a lot of the ecosystem services that reefs 
uh, do for us. The benefits we yeah. get, which is cost of protection, a lot of livelihoods depend on the fisheries uh, that coral reefs produce. I mean, 25% of, of the species diversity in the ocean is somewhat dependent on coral reefs. So it's pretty easy to imagine that there's a lot of consequences in also even our own food web. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, many other things such as uh, tourism. Tourism is a very important factor for many, many tropical nations. So if you take coral reefs out of the picture, you give a lot of less incentive, which means less economic growth. Um, so yeah, it's, there's a lot of indirect benefits we get from, from that. I mean, and, and, and that's really sort of kind of covers the next question from Blessed Sacrament is what would happen if all the coral reefs disappeared and really we, we wouldn't have all those benefits um, that... Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's pretty much the same question. So um, bleaching affects us by affecting coral reefs. Yep. So and when coral reefs are affected, uh, we have a lot of disadvantages, some of which we, many people are not even aware of. Uh, follow up, another question. If there were no trees, would the coral reef be able to provide enough oxygen for humanity? Well, I personally haven't done the math, so <laughs> I wouldn't know. But I do I mean, know that, I mean, coral reefs are probably, there's only one, less than 1% 1 of the ocean is coral yeah. reefs, right? So I don't think that they are very significant producers of oxygen for us. Uh, trees certainly much more. Um, but if you look at the ocean in general, yep. the, there's a lot of tiny little algae living in surface waters all over the ocean, more so even in the open ocean than here on these reefs. Yep. And they all produce oxygen. And if, if that's taken out, I think it's 50% of all the oxygen we breathe. Uh, about 50, 50, 60 percent. Yeah, yeah. So, so the estimates vary. vary. It would be yeah. difficult to breathe. It would be. It'd be, be like yeah. being yeah. Um, higher than Mont Blanc. Yeah. <laughs> um, the highest mountain in, 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 in Europe. Um, now from Titus in the UK, uh, largest sponge in the world. Largest sponge in the world. Ooh, I'm not sure, but we have one species here that's really, really large. It's called the red barrel sponge. Yeah. I think the largest individual here is about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. So <laughs> four people could easily sit in it, uh, which we shouldn't do, obviously. But uh, yeah, they can get really big. I think, ones. yeah, I mean, definitely those, those photos are quite incredible. The yeah. size of a small car. Uh, we're now going to uh, Wandsworth in London and some great questions uh, from Winston and Katya. Um, how does coral lose its colour? And that's from Winston. Uh, that has to do, in fact, with the bleaching. So the, the reason we call it bleaching is because it loses its colour. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason it loses its colour is because it loses its internal algae. So there are tiny little microscopic algae that live inside the coral tissue. Got it. And what these algae do is, like, like all algae, they do photosynthesis. They assimilate energy from the sun, turn it into sugars, and then they supply these sugars to the organism, to the coral. This is an incredibly efficient mechanism. So if you now increase the temperature slightly, that yep. mechanism essentially goes into overdrive. Uh, if too much oxygen is produced inside the coral, the coral will not feel so well, and then it will get rid of the algae, and because the algae is what gives the coral its color, it gets rid of the color. And then you basically have uh, transparent tissue. I mean, corals derive from jellyfish, right? Yeah. Uh, so the tissue of corals is transparent, and then what you would see is the skeleton underneath. Uh, but the, the coral is still alive, and if the bleaching, if the temperature, temperatures are too high for too long, the bleaching will persist, and the coral will eventually starve. But if the temperatures go down, it is actually able to reacquire these algae, reacquire its color, and then keep on thriving. So, I mean, just, just for our younger audiences, this, this sounds absolutely amazing. So you've got an animal related to a jellyfish, which has essentially vegetables inside its tissue, which is where... Built a giant rock underneath it. Built a giant rock underneath itself. And those, those, those algae, that sort of vegetable matter, can be all the different colors that you see in plants. We've got the reds and the oranges and the yellows and the greens and browns. Yeah. That gives lots of energy to the coral animal, so that's a nice, friendly relationship. And then the coral gives the algae a place to live where it's protected so from so that, know, that they predators. And then when it gets too hot, that whole friendship thing breaks down. Breaks down, basically. And the, the, the color gets expelled into the yeah. water. Yeah. 
it's a crazy amazing world out here but great question um from katya i would like to know why does the scientist nick uh wear plastic gloves underwater mm -hmm. okay very good point because there's currently no other option to keep our hands clean and get proper measurements it's something that I'm not very happy about, so neither are all my colleagues. Um, we certainly need to find ways to have lab equipment that is sustainable, uh, reusable or out made out of sustainable materials. Um, but currently uh, these things are not really on the market and uh, if they are then it would be almost not feasible to use them because we have limited funding, we have limited resources. So, but you, you wear gloves in the first place, yeah. so... We don't, they don't end up in the ocean. No, we bring but, everything back on land and we put it in proper gloves. But it's to make sure that the, whatever's on your hand doesn't interfere with the experiment. Exactly, if I touch this chamber underwater with my bare hands, yeah. I'm going to introduce my microbes, my own microbiome, Okay. Because we all have microbes so on all us, the in us, right? all over us, and it's not part of the reef, it's part ah, of my body. Okay. So I want to keep that separate from whatever I'm using to incubate my organs. It's a bit like being told to wash your hands. Just More or less, yeah. But washing your hands <laughs> doesn't do the trick in this case. Yeah. Uh, you've got to wear gloves. Yeah, yeah unfortunately. Um, and then we're looking for more sustainable barriers. Certainly, to, yes. yeah, yeah. If you have ideas to come up and make sustainable lab equipment, there's certainly a need for it. Brilliant. Um, we're now going over to uh, the Blessed Sacrament School in Canada. Uh, have you ever had a limb stuck in a reef? A and limb? A limb. Like have a you limb. Limb as in your foot ah, okay. or your hand. Has it ever got caught in a reef? And, that, and that's from uh, Addison. No. Um, certainly that can happen if people are reckless or... Do we, do we hear stories of that happening? Not, not particularly here, because the people that work here, we've, we've all done hundreds, even thousands of dives in some cases, so it doesn't really happen to us. But we do see divers, tourist divers that come here, they don't really have a lot of experience. Yeah, and they, they sometimes get too close to the reef, they damage the reef. I haven't personally seen anybody get stuck, but uh, certainly I've heard stories of that happening. Uh, it's just a matter of being aware of your surroundings and where you are. And if you respect this environment enough to stay a little bit away from it, there's no way you can get stuck in it. Okay. So learn how to dive in a way that respects the reef. Brilliant. Um, it's karma, eh? I guess. <laughs> uh, Deborah, um, Deborah would like to know, how can we help coral reefs survive when climate change is happening? Uh, what, what is it we can do to help? Because climate change seems such a big, you know, huge problem. I'm glad that question comes up. And I'm glad to hear that question um, coming up more and more often, particularly by young people. Um, to be honest, I would say what you can do uh, currently is learn about this world, but learn with a critical eye. Learn, I mean, it's, we live in times today where it's really easy to get information, uh, much easier than a few decades ago, but it's also a lot harder to separate good information from bad information, from whether that's unintended, you know, yeah. media wants yeah. to get attention yeah. as much as they want to inform you. Yeah. Uh, but there might also be some intentional misleading. There's, it's so easy to spread false information. So. Uh, you're still young. Take in this world, learn about this world, um, but, but be critical and try to get your facts right by ensuring that you know, the facts you get ha have authentic sources uh, and then build your opinion. And if you grow older and you, you are more and more motivated to do something, yeah, then pursue a career in this field. We, we certainly need to. And, and I think it's, for, for me, what the really, really interesting thing about climate change is, is that often the, the stories you hear are about putting the responsibility on the individual to change their behavior. It has to be. It has to be. Uh, I think sometimes that's slightly unfair insofar as that there, there are these system-wide, these government-led or business-led changes that we kind of would also like to see. So I think it's, it's also looking more widely, what are the laws that could be introduced? What is the infrastructure change that could be introduced that would, would, would help us uh, move to a, a less carbon-dependent future. 
what the individual steps are that we can do? Well, or I think, or, or just, just for students, not only to study what the, what the issues are mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. science behind it and the impacts of it on the natural world, mm -hmm. but also to think about what some of the solutions might look like. Certainly. Um, the solutions can be uh, obviously very individual-based things, like yeah. not eating, um, eating less meat or not flying so much. Um, you can also write something to your local politician. Um, you know, it's this. What I mean with it has to come from us is no politician is going to push for any change unless the the people he represents want that change. So um, it has to come from, as we say, bottom up. We have to be the ones voicing that we want this change, that we want things to be sustainable, yeah. and that will lead to not only politicians pushing for these changes, but also businesses, startups, people using ideas and going for it because the people are talking about it and because the people want these changes. So uh, yeah, as long as we start talking about it and as long as we start being more aware and more communicative, yeah. uh, all these little, all, everything will fall in place eventually. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, John, um, uh, John Mark would like to know, uh, can the coral reef come back to life? It's not dead yet, uh, but, uh, but what are the stages of, of coral reef recovery? Uh, different, depending on where you are, depending on, um, yeah, basically depending on where you are and how big the stress was. Uh, certainly corals can come back. Entire, I've seen entire reefs come back. Actually on this island here we have uh, reefs that have had devastating impacts from hurricanes, uh, from bleaching events. And within a couple of years they have come up to almost full recovery. Okay. Uh, there's neighboring islands where there was in fact full recovery. So um, reefs can come back. We just need to make sure uh, either they're lucky because the stressor changes or we are conscious enough to make sure the stressor goes out of the system and then, yeah, the reef can always come back. Perfect, Nick, we've got uh, three questions and two minutes. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. So, um, we've got Aiden. How many different organisms have you researched so far? Uh, hmm. Groups of organisms, four. That is corals, algae, sponges, and fish. Uh, but individual species, probably between 50 and 100, something like this. You'll have to count when you go back. Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Say. I'm <laughs> not sure. Uh, and two questions uh, from San Francisco in the US. Uh, why are coral different shapes? shapes? Ooh. So I thought that was a beast of crab just around my foot there. Sorry about that. Oh, that's <laughs> Corals have different shapes because different shapes have different advantages depending on where you are. Uh -huh. So I'm going to give you, out of time reasons, one example. Uh, a coral lives off light, right, because it has these algae in it. Now, if you grow in a sheeting form, you're going to catch more light because you yep. have more surface area. But if you're, so if you're deep and there's not too much light, you want to kind of sheet out so you catch as much as possible. If you live very close to the surface, yep. there's a lot of light, sometimes too much. Yep. And then you might want to curve it down a bit more to make sure you don't have too much light. So there's many environmental variables that change uh -huh. and different shapes have different advantages. Perfect. And then last question is, who is the most inspirational person you have ever met? The most inspirational person I've ever met would, that's definitely Richard Feynman. Yes. He's a theoretical physicist who uh, already received the Nobel Prize as well. Um, this man is one of the best science communicators I have ever seen. He, if it, and he's, he's doing like, you know, black holes and quantum physics and like all the really complex stuff. But he can communicate it in a way that is so incredibly inspiring. I would advise anyone, if, you're, if you want to get a bit of motivation for science, check out Richard Feynman. And he's got a great book, uh, maybe to start with the pleasure of finding things out. Yeah, yeah. Um, if they're already interested in reading those books, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Um, and, and for me, uh, I, I would have to say Jane Goodall. Okay. Um, I, mm -hmm. I, I love the fact that she um, didn't have enough support to get to university. She went out to Africa. She was then invited to do a degree at Cambridge. Wow. Um, and her study on the, the chimpanzees in, in Gombe 
but then to turn all that uh, not only amazing science but turn all that into a, a huge international sort of sustainability and environmental education program roots and shoots and I, I, you know to have that love of nature that academic excellence and then to be able to communicate and create that change and make that impact uh, and make that impact mm -hmm. amazing amazing woman wow um, very sadly that's all we have time for today thank you so much uh, for being part of this meet the expert with Nick and uh, Nick thank you so much um, really lovely interaction with the students my pleasure um, so thank you do join us again tomorrow when we are looking at the deeper reefs we've got Pim um, who will be talking about the work of his team and also we'll be doing a couple of live investigations where we'll be looking at the impact of depth both on pressure and on the availability of light. Uh, so until then, thank you very much. It's goodbye from Kamabi and goodbye from Coral Live. Bye-bye.